can ever go back. Hey, I'm in the shot. <laughs> you are. Hey, Buzzheads, Curtis Tucker here with Enid Buzz. We are down in Oklahoma City, and uh, we are going to talk to Michelle Malkin. She is down here uh, doing some interviews and things like that, but she will be in Enid this Saturday. If you go to EnidBuzz.com, get on the mobile app. We've got information, uh, the times and all that, but Michelle's going to tell us about that. She's going to tell us why she's in Oklahoma uh, and her new show that's coming up that's going to be debuting there Saturday morning in Enid. So... Welcome you back to Oklahoma. Hi, Michelle. How are you? Good. How are you, Curtis? I am good. Hey, kind of tell us what you're doing here in Oklahoma City and then kind of discuss what you're going to be doing in Enid on Saturday. Well, as you know, I've been reporting on the case of Daniel Holtzclaw, the former Oklahoma City police officer who I believe, after a year of investigating and reporting, has been railroaded by uh, police departments, by prosecutors, and now is fighting uh, for his direct appeal in his case, appealing his convictions before the Court of Criminal Appeals. And my two-part series, Daniel in the Den, I think really helped shed a lot of new light on the case and expose facts that so many people here in Oklahoma and Oklahoma City have had no idea about. And now, in the, the, the several months since the uh, series came out, uh, the case has garnered national attention. So we are going back to Enid, where we had debuted the original two-part series, uh, to screen for free a new episode that not only updates people on all of the John Grisham novel-like twists and turns in Daniel's case, but also sets it in the larger context, Curtis, of wrongful convictions. And unfortunately, too many have happened in this country. A lot of people would be shocked to know, for example, that there have been more than 2,000 people who were wrongly convicted and then later, much later, exonerated because they had been falsely accused and falsely convicted. So we'll be bringing in exonerees, two of them who are former law enforcement officers themselves, to tell their stories and to talk about how they survived and successfully won their exonerations. And you know, the one thing that I've noticed since the last time you were in Enid, it seemed like when I would report and do posts uh, back then, there was a lot of people that would get online and you know the trolls would say he's guilty blah 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 i've seen a huge change since you've done your your shows that a lot of people now are starting to say that they believe that he is innocent and uh, i think it's a lot of of what you've been investigating now real quick we've heard a lot about these secret meetings dna the stuff like that is there anything moving as far as that, or is that kind of still kind of hidden and nobody knows what's going on? Do you know what's going on with any of that? Yeah, well, I can tell you this. The mo one of the most significant developments since December has been the weighing in of six internationally renowned experts on DNA and forensic science. And they released publicly a report that analyzes all of the forensic errors in the case. And they concluded, after doing a thorough review of the forensic science, of the testimony of the crime lab analyst Elaine Taylor, uh, that Daniel absolutely deserves a fair trial. And he did not get one because of so many of the misstatements and inaccuracies of the testimony of, the, of uh, Elaine Taylor, as well as the assistant district attorney who tried the case, Galind Giger. Now, the reason that's pertinent is because that seems to be at the heart of these secret hearings that you're asking about. What happened was there was secret evidence that was sealed by the state attorney general, and he made a motion uh, to the Court of Criminal Appeals, which ended up remanding the whole secret sealed issue back to the trial judge, uh, who was Timothy Henderson. And Timothy Henderson held two days of secret hearings in June, the 26th and the 27th, at which Daniel's own lawyers from uh, the Public Defender's Office were not allowed to attend. In fact, they didn't even know the hearings took place until after, they didn't even know about it until after the hearings had taken place. Uh, there were secret transcripts that were sealed and filed with the court, 347 pages of them. And my understanding is that the public defender is reviewing them now, I believe, but Daniel has had no direct access to what kind of information is in there. And at least a couple of local reporters here uh, did a public records request and um, were able to uncover uh, who attended the meetings. And one of the people who attended the meetings was Elaine Taylor's crime lab supervisor, a man named Campbell Ruddick. Okay, and so just out, out of curiosity, have you talked to Daniel in a while? Has it? Absolutely. In fact, I've visited him many times um, since January, so over this past year, uh, and I talk to him fairly frequently. I have to tell you, I think he does agree as well um, that given everything that's happened in his case, that there has been a huge sea change. And what's happening is, 
what he asked me to do when I first started looking into this case and what he told people when I interviewed him by phone in my series. He just wanted people to take a deeper look, dig deeper and make their own decision about what happened in this case. The more that you know about uh, how shoddy the initial investigation was, how confirmation bias driven the two detectives were that were in charge of the case, how unfounded and ungrounded uh, their conclusion that Daniel was somehow some kind of sociopath, that he was racist, that he hated women, there was never any grounding for this. And then when you took a, a look at each and every one of the allegations and really broke it down, as opposed to treating them in the aggregate and convicting him collectively of things that he did not do. And I think the key evolution for me over the past year, the, the more that I've dug into the case, Curtis, is that it's not merely that there's a reasonable doubt mountain of exculpatory evidence. I firmly believe that this man is actually innocent of each and every one of these charges. It is a miscarriage of justice like I've never seen in my 25 plus years of journalism. And again, I think putting it into the larger context of how wrongful convictions happen, it becomes clear to people, because that's the question I've always gotten. Well, how could this have happened? It's so unbelievable. It's so beyond any kind of realm of, of understanding or comprehension. But when you dig into the case, when you look at the facts that we brought to the public, particularly with regard to the forensic science and the way that DNA is misused in the courtroom every single day, it's completely believable and understandable how this happened. The key is, what do you do when you know the truth? There have too, been too many people, and I know, within the Oklahoma city government circles who know the truth but are standing on the sidelines. And I'm urging everyone to come out to the screening on Saturday uh, to see more of the facts that we've uncovered and to listen to the panel of experts and exonerees that we're bringing because there's going to be a, I think, a very milestone open public discussion after the screening of all of the issues involved. Great, and that was, I was gonna ask you that as well. So there will be new evidence on this new episode that you're debuting? Yes, we're going to uh, talk to, to people more about uh, these secret hearings, the secret matters, um, and as I said, we're going to be talking to other exonerees who are standing up for Daniel Holtzclaw. I think this is hugely significant because you have former and active duty law enforcement officials from across the country who know how proper investigations are supposed to be run and they're flying in to stand by Daniel Holtzclaw. I wish more of the, the people who knew him the best within the Oklahoma City Police Department, who know what kind of an excellent cop he was, how dedicated he was to his job, particularly in the prestigious gang unit to, uh, that he served in. I mean, this is extraordinary. This is a man who had only been on the force for three years. And I believe, uh, especially after talking to seasoned investigators and seasoned um, uh, p police officers from across the country, that what happened here was, Daniel was too good at his job, and there are people who just seem to have had it in for him somehow. And that's another question people ask us, well, what was it about Daniel? Daniel was good at his job, and he was unapologetic about it. And I, I really believe that what happened was a perfect storm of so many unfortunate factors that led to his railroading. You have to think about the political and cultural climate at the time. This was the summer of Ferguson when so many of these women came forward, made big public deals out, out of uh, their allegations, and of course are now turning around and suing both the police department and Daniel Holtzclaw. The very people that railroaded Daniel Holtzclaw are now yoked to him in these high dollar civil lawsuits. It, it really is surreal. But it is, unfortunate, re a reality for Daniel Holtzclaw and his family. But they continue to fight, and that's part, a big part of uh, this episode as well. The fighting spirit that people have who know that they're innocent. They never give up. That's what I've heard over and over again from exonerees. Wow, that's great. And so his family is going to be at the event in Enid, Oklahoma on Saturday, correct? That's correct. Eric and Kumiko, his uh, mother and father, both of them uh, with law enforcement backgrounds themselves. Eric still a uh, law enforcement officer in Enid, Oklahoma. His sister Jenny, who's been his most incredible advocate, public advocate out there getting the truth from day one out to the public and on social media. Brian Bates, the original defense team investigator who has a fantastic website that was such a huge resource for me, really opened my eyes, holtzclawtrial.com. Uh, and and there will be other special guests um, sharing their expertise as well.
Wow, so there's going to be tons of information there. Now, this is yes. at Central National Bank Center, downtown Enid, Oklahoma. I believe it kicks off about, what, 10, 1030 on Saturday? Doors open at 10. The screening will start at 1030. And it's completely free, correct? It is absolutely free. You'll want to line up early because we're expecting a big crowd. I know there's a football game later <laughs> on, but, uh, you know, get your enlightenment and education in the morning and do the football in the afternoon. Yeah, and what, what I would like to say is if you're either, if you think Daniel's guilty or you're on the fence, this is a great way to come and ask questions, and if you walk away with, with the answers that you, you don't believe or something, then at least you've tried. You've at least looked at the case. I mean, I've looked at everything that you've done, and there's a lot of questions. And I question the, the length of, of his conviction, the 236 years, which, I mean, is that going to be something that's going to be looked at in, in what everybody's trying to get going, so, the retrial? or Yes, yes, and I'm glad you raised that issue because a, a 263-year sentence that was all aggregated with uh, all of the accusers all lumped in together, the issue in legal terms is called joinder, and it is part of uh, his appeal that was filed on February 1st. And I've talked to a lot of legal experts, and it is puzzling, except when you realize that the reason why they lump them all together um, in this big uh, collective group is because if you split each and every one of those uh, accusers cases and allegations separately it would all fall apart like a Jenga tower. Okay well great so we're gonna let you off the hook here but we're gonna see you in Enid on Saturday. Um, everybody get down to Central National Bank Center again I've got information on enidbus.com if they want to find more about your program uh, CRTV and all that where can they go to find more information about this and about you so CRTV.com is where my show Michelle Malkin investigates broadcasts we're in season two now and uh, people who come to the free screening will be getting a sneak peek at this latest episode it's called railroaded surviving wrongful convictions um, but there are so many other public policy topics and untold stories that we're this season so you can subscribe there you can get a sense of uh, a taste for free of uh, so many of the clips and shows that we're working on and for Daniel in the Den the series that we did last December if people want to catch up you can just go to my YouTube channel at Michelle Malkin M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E-M-A-L-K-I-N and the other resources I would recommend are of course HoltzclawTrial.com which I mentioned and Jenny Holtzclaw's Facebook page for all the latest updates on the case okay great thank you Michelle we will see you in Enid on Saturday everybody Everybody go to enabuzz.com, get more information, and we will see you all there.